um, one, one, one solution at a time, one school at a time, one tertiary institution at a time, one polytechnic at a time to begin to have decent student accommodation for the teeming number of students that come out of the um, um, secondary educational system in Nigeria. Um, that is the intention and that is the objective of this call, uh, of this uh, webinar. Um, on the panel, we do have representatives from the academia, uh, the Nigerian University Commission, um, investors uh, and developers, student accommodation developers. Students are going to be on this um, webinar as well. And so we expect it to be a very a vibrant conversation that highlights the pain um, from every perspective. But beyond that, also identifies the critical low hanging fruit and the solutions that we all can begin to implement. So as Dambik IBTC group, um, we thought it wise to bring this forward. Um, and, and the reason are not far-fetched. Uh, within the group, we do have an infrastructure fund that is dedicated to providing investment opportunities for um, investors within the infrastructure space in Nigeria. Um, one of the key pivotal area of focus for the fund is in the area of student accommodations. Um, and it is no doubt why we have uh, decided to bring all the stakeholders together. Uh, we also have representatives within the group from the real estate finance team, um, which sits within the bank. Um, they are the premier uh, real estate investors or uh, financial supporters in the market. And they are also on this call to hear and get insights from all the experts as to how to solve this problem. And last but not the least, within the uh, STAMIC IBTC group, we are we are fund managers to UPDC REITs. Um, and we believe that uh, in terms of bringing up new products, um, the various investors and in the REITs might find student accommodation uh, as a, a veritable proposition for, for investment. So I encourage every all the participants to please ask questions. Um, share um, all, all that you think you need uh, to know about uh, student accommodation and the opportunities that lies, uh, lies therein. And we hope we have a very, very fruitful, uh, fruitful deliberation at the end of the day. So Tomoa, back to you. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good one. Thank you very much, Dolu. Thank you for that. Um, it's going to be an interesting session indeed. Uh, just to mention that we are also streaming live on YouTube. Um, on our YouTube page, Stambik IBTC on YouTube, we're also streaming live, so um, feel free to join as well. Um, thank you for that. Um, so we'll go straight into the next item on the agenda, um, which is a presentation um, from Adin Riola Adi Adi Deji. Um, Dairy works in the real estate um, finance business, uh, and she would be sharing with us insights um, on students' accommodation and financing opportunities that we see um, in that space. Um, thank you, Darren. Um, good morning, please. You may go ahead. Thank you, Tomiwa. Can you see my screen, please? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Let me try if my video would work now. Okay. All right. Uh, Derry, just before you go, uh, you can put us on um, presentation mode. Sure. Okay, thank you. That's fine. Thank you all. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining the webinar, Student Accommodation um, by the STAMIC IBTC Real Estate Finance Team, as well as the Infrastructure Fund. So um, today I'll be speaking about a couple of things. Um, firstly would be the real estate capabilities um, that we have as a group, um, as well as, you know, the student accommodation, as well as the real estate market, and in particular, the student accommodation and the opportunities that exist um, for both investors and um, both investors and the bank, as well as the infrastructure fund. So um, the SAMIC IBT, IBT has a dedicated real estate finance team, 
um, who provides financing, investment management, and advisory services to clients. Um, we have multiple sectors, and that includes the residential, commercial offices, retail, industrial, and alternative real estate. Um, the alternative real estate sector is where the student accommodation actually falls on that, and I'll speak a bit more about that as we go along. Um, and the different solutions that we offer um, include, you know, the real estate investment trust, we do um, development finance, as well as term loans. Um, and then we have a dedicated team across, like I mentioned before, the real estate finance team and the infrastructure team, as well as the real estate investment trust. Okay. So um, just an overview, a brief overview about the Nigerian real estate market. So we have the retail, we have the office, we have the residential, um, hospitality, industrial, alternative real estate. Like I mentioned earlier, the student accommodation is under the alternative real estate. And the complexity is relatively, we look at that as a, a medium complexity. And typically all of these um, different types of um, real estate requires both equity and debt funding. So now I'm just moving directly into the student accommodation in, in Nigeria. So most university students require accommodation for the duration of their studies, and which is typically four years in Nigeria. Um, and the need for quality education has grown substantially. Um, so I'll just give an example. So we have a university who has 8,000 bed spaces available um, for a student population of 50, 58,000. That already gives you a supply gap of about 86%. Um, and we also have another school where we have six halls of residences providing accommodation to less than 10%. And then the table below just kind of highlights again um, the occupancy rates for the Nigerian um, accommodation that exists. It also shows, if you look over here, it also shows the, 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 the amounts of the average rentals. So, just speaking a bit more about the student accommodation, we just thought it was important to highlight some challenges that have been that have been created by the you know low student accommodation that we've had. So you know um, students are unable to get um, um, accommodation internally. So sometimes they have to go out and complete compete with the public for the housing that's available. There are also safety concerns. So students, you know seeking you know lower rentals might go to high crime rate areas um, and where there could be potential damage um, and less accessibility to the campus which contributes to poor performance so i've spoken a bit about the real estate um, the the student accommodation um, and you know the different the why there's an opportunity there. So I'll just speak a bit more about the risk and mitigants, or the risk that we, we recognize in the market, the mitigants that we've seen, as well as further opportunities for investors. So the first thing is the revenue assurance. So sometimes, like we know, um, students' rental payments might not be sufficient enough to cover things like debt service or even returns to an investor. But a way to enforce that or a mitigant to that might be, you know, the university enforcing payments of um, those spaces, you know, as just like you're paying for your school fees, you also enforce, you know, if you're going to get this particular accommodation, you have to pay, you know, at the time you're paying your school fees, obviously it's optional and dependent on if the student decides to go for that particular student accommodation. So we think that might be able to mitigate some of those risks. Um, in terms of the strike action, we're all in Nigeria, we know what exists there. We know that there's usually frequent um, strike actions that, that happen. But what we're looking to do is to partner with the reputable project sponsor who has long-term plans and, and is willing to take long-term risks and understands the, the, the nature of that market. And what we would typically expect from a um, standard bank or Stambic view is, you know, some type of rental support guarantee from that parent to kind of give us comfort. Then lastly, just the operation and maintenance. Um, so student housing is obviously more susceptible to, you know, damages. So, but as long as we have, you know, a, a reputable um, facility management, I think that could help curb that risk. So I'm just moving straight on into the opportunities that exist. So first of all, there's a large supply gap. Based on everything I've said, we can see that there's, there's a huge gap between the demand 
and the supply that is available in the market. Um, and this is synonymous with you know, public tertiary institutions, which have about 1.75 million graduates. Um, also the funding requirements. So currently there's limited funding for development of student accommodation. So some of an investor or someone who's willing to take on, um, who has some capital and is willing to take on that risk will definitely benefit a lot from the first, a first mover advantage to an extent. Also there's limited alternatives for students. So that market exists because um, there's limited supply. So currently students are competing with, you know, the, 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 the rooms and the accommodation outside of school, um, which is obviously not, not ideal. Also, if you look at the demographics of Nigeria, um, where you have the typical, a typical, um, well, the median age in Nigeria is about 18.6 years. Um, so that already tells you, you know, we have a huge, huge gap in terms of um, the students that are coming out of the system and the accommodation that exists. So I'm just gonna briefly start, speak about the structuring um, and how we would typically look at the structure. So I think first of all, it's important to know that there are two types. So there's a there's a there's a there's a single funding structure and there's one that we look at like a JV. So they're pretty similar, but I think I'll move because of time, I'll move on to the JV structure and just explain the differences a little bit. So for this particular structure where you have a JV, um, the developer establishes, you know, the SPV for the student accommodation um, and the university and the developer enter into an agreement for the development of the hostel, right, of the student accommodation. Um, and then the university through the federal or state government provides the land and transfers property title to the SPV. Um, I mean, there's a lot of conversations around that which I'm sure we'll speak to in the panel session. Um, then the developer then guarantees um, Stambic IBTC for development of the, of the loan. So that could be, obviously we have different arms that deal that. Um, and then Stambic IBTC then gives the loan to the SPV. Um, and the university, like I said, creates rules enforcing payments of rent from the students. Um, obviously there are multiple considerations here, you know, title of the land, like I said, that's gonna be discussed further during the panel sessions. We have rent considerations, sponsor considerations. We want a sponsor that has a good track record. Project delivery is very key. Um, the development manager has to have a capacity, and and you know you also has to be a, a trusted um, a trusted person that can deliver the job. So, like I said, difference between this and the previous slide is literally just um, the fact that this has a JV structure, while the other assumes you know the developer provides the land as well. Um, and then just finally, um, just in terms of the key financing considerations that we will typically look at. So like I mentioned earlier, again, land is coming up again. So you have the land due diligence. There has to be you know, extensive duty done on the land held by the project, um, just to make sure that you know, as, a, as someone who is funding, you're, you're covered. Um, and like I said, that will be discussed further again. Um, and then you have the sponsor considerations. Um, the client or developer must have ex existing track record or experience um, financial strengths with, you know, decent balance sheets to cover the cost of a run when you're building. Um, and then obviously we have the SPV structuring considerations, um, as well as, like I mentioned earlier, some type of rental support guarantee in the event that um, something happens. Then you have rent considerations, contractual rent cash flows. That's the rent that the, the, the students will be paying. Like I said, that would be, would be kind of guided according to um, what maybe when they're paying their school fees, just some structure around that. Um, and then obviously project delivery and quality of assets. Um, so these are the typical financing considerations that we we'll look at as standard bank and you know things that I guess we would expect um, would expect also developers and investors to also also look into considering. So um, just to summarize, um, you know, this is a very, there's, there's multiple and amazing opportunities that exist in this sector. And, you know, it's a sector that we see growing um, as, we, as we move on or as we, as we grow in Nigeria, given where we are, we expect the sector to continually grow. Um, and it will be a very amazing opportunity for, um, for investors, you know, um, investors, banks, as well as, um, um, the infrastructure fund, everyone else can come to the table and just make this work. So um, I can see a couple of questions. Um, oh, so people asking for the slides. So I can share that with Tomiwa 
post this. Um, post this. Okay. Thank you, Tamiwa. I'll just hand over back to you now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Derry, for the insights. Um, very interesting insights. And we hope that we'll get into it in depth um, once we get into the panel discussion, which will be coming shortly. Um, just the next item on the agenda would be a remark from the National Universities Commission. Um, the executive secretary is humbly represented by Mr. Boniface um, Ode. Um, he's currently the chief student officer in the National Universities Commission. Um, he's the acting head of the career service division and the directorate um, of students. Um, just to mention and to apologize in advance that um, Mr. Boniface is in transit, so um, the communication might be a bit shaky, but we would make it work. Um, good morning, Mr. Boniface. Thank you for joining us, please. Um, you may go ahead. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mr. Boniface. Thanks for having me. Yes, I can hear you. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you, Mr. Boniface. So we just wanted to get your thoughts and your insights as to the issues um, being faced at the moment across the universities as it relates to um, student accommodation and student housing. Just a quick, a quick overview yes, on this. Come again, come again, please. Okay, we just want to get your thoughts and your perspective as to issues that you've seen and then you've encountered um, across universities as it relates to student accommodation. Okay, thank you very much. Well, the National Universities Commission as the regulatory agency of all federal universities, state and private, indeed all degree awarding institutions. So as for the accommodation issue for students, this directorate of students where I, uh, I belong, we have the mandate of ensuring that universities provide at least 60% accommodation. To at least to accommodate 60% of the students on campus. So that's one of our mandates. And we encourage universities as such. But from our evaluation exercises, the, the last two exercises in 2019 and 20, 2021, we discovered that over 90% of the students are not the accommodated ones is in rot. The environment is not so conducive. So that's one of the issues we have with the university as regards accommodation. And the commission is doing everything to encourage universities to sit up. One of the measures is to encourage uh, public private partnership. Of recent, the Federal Ministry of Education is trying to go into collaboration with infrastructure concession and regulatory commission to give permission to universities that want to go into PPP. The PPP initiative is the only way out since they seem not to have enough funds to develop properties of their own. But I know land, land is not an issue because almost every university has more than enough land. So we hope that uh, things will improve. And uh, with this initiative that you have just brought on board, I think uh, it will be a great, it will pave way for public enlightenment and more stakeholders will come, especially development partners who come in to cope this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much for the insights, Mr. Boniface. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for that. So we'll be speaking a lot more on that in the panel discussion um, that would come after we'll go more in depth into um, all that you're talking on. But thank you for um, staring the pot. Um, so we'll go right into um, Mr. Boniface, if you can go ahead and mute, and then we'll come back afterwards for the panel discussion. Thank you.
Um, so we'll go right into the keynote um, speech. Um, the keynote will be given by Mr. Um, Raghav Gandhi. Um, Mr. Raghav is the Managing Director of Acorn Investment Management Limited, um, is the Chief Investment Officer of Acorn Holdings Limited. Um, Mr. Raghav is an experienced real estate professional um, with a proven track record of delivering results globally across various asset classes. Um, he jointly led the growth of major commercial real estate um, startup ventures in India and headed the development of projects across MENA regions for a real estate um, developer headquartered in Kuwait. Um, he was responsible for optimizing returns from a number of underperforming investments there. Um, he subsequently established his own consulting practice, which advised GCC families and corporates on real estate transactions and projects in the UK and then the Middle East. Uh, Mr. Raghav joined Acorn in February 2020 as a consultant for the implementation of the Acorn REITs, um, working closely with the corporate finance and corporate affairs legal teams, as well as with um, transactional advisors, service providers and investors. Um, Effective from 1st of November 2020, Mr. Raga was appointed as the Chief Investment Officer of um, Acorn Holdings Limited and then a Managing Director at Acorn Investment Management Limited. Uh, Mr. Raga holds an MBA from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, and a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the London School of Economics. Um, good morning, Mr. Raga. Thank you for joining us. Um, We're very pleased to have you on and to listen to your um, keynote. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, I'd like to start by, uh, you know, wishing everyone a good morning. Uh, uh, appreciate uh, uh, the Stanbic IBTC team in giving me the opportunity to uh, share some of my thoughts uh, and experiences on uh, student accommodation and also in the establishment of REITs. Um, I have a, a short presentation that I will take you through. Um, the way uh, this uh, presentation has been uh, structured is it's, you know, it, it gives a, a little bit of uh, background as far as the work we do at ACORN, um, but I, I'll keep it less about ACORN and more about just sharing some general knowledge on uh, the, the, the platform that we've developed and how we feel that that platform um, is conducive to uh, delivering um, high returns uh, within a student accommodation uh, uh, space. So hopefully uh, the, 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 the participants will find it uh, of interest. So in terms of um, uh, ACORN uh, itself, just very quickly, you know, our mission is centered around providing uh, rental housing in, uh, in Africa. Um, this is uh, by, uh, through the provision of affordable quality, safe and environmentally sustainable housing solutions um, and investment products. Uh, starting with uh, purpose-built student accommodation, which you know many of you would be familiar as a globally uh, recognized uh, asset class. But as um, as per the earlier presentation by Darren, um, clearly very much in its infancy here in Africa, which of course then points to uh, the significant growth potential uh, that exists on the continent. Which is, I'm sure, the reason that uh, you know we've got a lot of interest. Uh, with respect to what uh, what can be achieved in this asset class. Um, as with any investment thesis, it's premised around, uh, uh, or, or the starting point has to be uh, macroeconomic, I feel. Uh, you know, the story has to be top down, that it makes sense. And um, uh, I think this is a, a, a thesis that would really uh, resonate right across the continent uh, or particularly within sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and, you know, it's predicated on uh, the demographic dividend that exists within uh, the population here in Kenya. So, of course, I'm going to be speaking uh, largely uh, from a Kenyan perspective because that's what I know. Uh, but I think uh, uh, everyone would agree that the uh, parallels exist right across uh, uh, the continent. So uh, as I mentioned, there's a demographic dividend. The average, the median age that we here have here in Kenya is 18 years um, with uh, more than 75% of the population aged less than 35. So essentially, you know, when you're able to uh, uh, cater towards the, the young, the, the, the youth in, uh, uh, in Kenya, 
you're going to have a scalable platform to work with. Um, and, uh, you know, for us, um, as I mentioned, uh, we started our journey with uh, the development of purpose-built student accommodation. And you can see here in terms of the, uh, the growth in university enrollment year on year uh, between public and private uh, universities on the right-hand side, you know, you've got uh, 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 an annualized growth of anywhere between, I would say four to 7%. Last year, we had a growth in enrollment of 7.3%. After a, you know, kind of a uh, almost a curtailing that took place as a result of uh, of, of COVID, and 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 given the government's uh, you know in, initiative in investing in education, we expect that enrollment growth to continue. Um, the other thing that I think is important for uh, you know anyone who's interested in this space or or any form of real estate, I think one of the typical um, uh, uh, let's say mistakes that we make as uh, uh, you know folks in the real estate space, and and believe you me, I, I mean I've, I, I'm now approaching 20 years, um, uh, despite my youthful looks in the sector, um, uh, and you know we fall into this trap very much because it is an emotional asset class. It does uh, it does you know uh, develop this connect with human beings. Um, that we we like to go with our gut, so we'll say, okay, I think this this land parcel is prime for a mall, and and you know you do go ahead and spend uh, millions of dollars on that mall, and then it ends up being empty. So uh, my you know for for a number of years now, uh, I have been a strong believer that even any real estate decision should be predicated on research. And that's definitely something that uh, I have appreciated as an ethos that we have, uh, that we have followed in, in, in ACORN. Um, and so what we did in uh, around 2017, 2016, 2017, was we um, uh, appointed, uh, we mandated a uh, consulting firm, a global consulting firm to conduct uh, extensive and substantial research to help us identify where the opportunities lie uh, uh, within, uh, within housing. And, uh, and what they were able to identify for us was, again, you know, based on that demographic dividend, uh, the, the significant opportunity that lies within uh, uh, student housing for uh, within Kenya and but then really getting into the detail in terms of thinking about you know based on the typical cost metrics you know what what are the returns that you would need to seek and therefore what are the price points that one we would need to strive for and what we were able to do through that research was identify two specific product segments two specific customer segments um, you know, would I feel for uh, development of student accommodation? So we actually created then two separate product segments. One is what we refer to as Quetu, which is kind of like a middle income, uh, upper middle income, uh, uh, you know, uh, rental housing offering where um, we, as at 2020, the estimate for the addressable market was 45,000 beds. Currently, we're only offering about 4,400, which is less than 10%. So you can see that it's a, you know, still significant headroom for growth. And then on top of that, what you've got is um, uh, Kijani, which is our more mass market, affordable uh, housing uh, uh, offering. And that has a, as of 2020, had an estimated market size of 70,000. So when I speak to investors, you know, I often tell them that, you know, for, for what we're doing, for what we're offering, uh, we have uh, uh, an addressable market in total of almost 110,000 beds, which again, gives you that significant uh, uh, scope for growth. And uh, whereas with Quetu, as I mentioned, we've already got a number of uh, operational assets. In Kijani, we just operationalized the first one uh, this quarter, which is of course a significant milestone for us. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I think, Anyone looking uh, at um, you know uh, bringing in investors, uh, what do investors seek? Investors seek a scalable platform, and that's uh, really what we are trying to establish here at Acorn. Uh, whether we, we look at the different axes, so we've got a three-dimensional graph out here just to highlight the, uh, the 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 scope for growth that is available, which is not just 
through customer segments, which is what we're showing on the x-axis. You know, you've got student housing. The next offering we're doing is young professionals, and you can work all the way up to retirement. And then, of course, you know, within Kenya, there's the different cities. Currently, our focus has been only within Nairobi, but you know, next year onwards, we're going to start looking at some of the other, um, uh, let's say, secondary uh, uh, tier two cities uh, that are there in Kenya. That again, you know, points to uh, further growth, and then maybe uh, subsequent to that, looking at growth within East A East Africa, and then maybe subsequent Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's a it's a multi product. Uh, a multi-decade uh, uh, growth opportunity, which is something that, uh, you know, of course, is uh, going to be appealing for uh, investors that are looking for that scalable opportunity that I spoke to earlier. And this is how we do it. This is our business model. We have spent considerable amount of time and effort uh, and invest in establishing a um, integrated real estate platform, um, uh, which is, I think, uh, you know, unique within the uh, Africa space. And, uh, uh, you know, when I, when I speak to a number of European investors, they, they talk about how there are European real estate firms who haven't achieved um, the, the business model that we've set out here. And the way we've done it is to essentially create two operating subsidiaries, one subsidiary, which is called Acorn Management Services Limited, which takes care of development management, property management. Um, so essentially ensuring that, you know, uh, uh, the buildings, the, the projects are constructed on budget, on time and with quality. And then once they're constructed, um, they are man managed because these are rental housing uh, uh, offerings. So we have to manage them on a day-to-day -day basis, make, ensure their upkeep, ensure that they're, you know, safe environments, ensure that they're clean environments. Um, and so that's the role of the property management team. And then you have Acorn Investment Management Limited, which is the company that I'm the managing director for. And our role as a licensed entity is to license, is to manage, uh, sorry, the two REITs that we have set up. And those two REITs are highlighted um, in that dotted square. You've got the Acorn Student Accommodation Development REIT and the Acorn Student Accommodation Income REIT. Um, uh, and, and so Kenya is unique that it allows for development REIT and, uh, uh, you know, the regulations allow for development REITs. And in that sense, uh, we, you know, we achieved the milestone that we established the first DREIT globally, at least as per my knowledge, uh, but happy to be corrected on that. And then uh, what it also enables us to do is to uh, look at, um, you know, establishing further REITs uh, that, you know, the, the bottom two that are highlighted there are not in existence, but it just points to the, uh, the growth capacity that is there. Um, and what we look to do. And of course, then on the extreme right, we've identified the different capital sources that we have uh, in order to deliver this platform. Um, and again, you know, you'll hear this reverberating. Uh, I speak extensively about it. It was one of the learnings that I, um, that I, uh, uh, that I had um, at an early stage in my career. When you're looking to um, establish an enterprise, it's key to have that scalability. And so currently we have about seven operational assets in total between the two REITs. These are highlighted here and you can see how year on year we've been launching uh, at least one asset you know, in the past, well, this current year, I should say, we launched two assets, and that's something that will continue to grow uh, over time. And uh, so the platform offers about 4,400 uh, beds in total. And, uh, you know, uh, we welcome any, uh, anyone to come and visit us. You'll, you'll get a chance to see our properties. Um, and, you know, down below, we've kind of highlighted what, uh, what has made it a very defensive asset class. Uh, many of you will be surprised that even during COVID, after the initial lockdown, we actually reopened our properties during the middle of COVID, during the middle of pandemic, and we saw a gradual uptick in, uh, in, uh, in occupancy so that we ended 2020 with somewhere around 75 to 80 percent occupancy for the assets that were operational at that time, which again highlights the defensive nature uh, uh, of, of uh, you know, PBSA, which is, uh, I, I'm sure, the, one of the reasons that, uh, um, you know, there's, there's significant interest uh, for, uh, for taking part in this space. Um, and again, just 
continuing that story of scalability, you can see how we've grown from 2017 to 2000, uh, uh, 2022. This just shows you, it's a pie chart showing the pie growing uh, because it's comprised of the total. You know, how uh, we've been able to grow both segments over time. Um, by the end of the year, we will have uh, properties that are operational, which is uh, that I um, I was asked to kind of highlight, you know, what are the challenges and, and happy to speak more to this during the, uh, the panel so that I don't uh, overreach the allocated time. Um, I think the challenges that we faced, particularly when we've been speaking to is uh, you know it is an unfamiliar asset class. Uh, I think typically what you find is student accommodation is provided by bed sitters. Uh, it's non-institutional. It's not high quality, um, and I think that uh, has meant that when we speak to investors, you know, well, I would say when we initially spoke to investors, you know, they didn't they couldn't get their head around what we were talking about, and you know, getting them to come visit us and uh, and see what we're doing and see what we're about definitely helped bridge that gap. And it was quite interesting. Again, Darren mentioned, you know, um, uh, uh, one of the risks being student housing is more likely to face vandalism. You know, you can face uh, issues with respect to uh, uh, collections of rent, and that's why you have to seek guarantees from parents. Um, we actually don't face any of those issues. Um, and I think Sometimes we're a bit harsh on our uh, on our younger uh, brethren, and we forget about uh, the way we were. I don't think, you know, uh, uh, we would have gone around vandalizing places. So uh, I think, but it, it's a very fair point because it is it is it, those are exactly the same as we made. But in Ken We can now that's my class. I'll speak. Apologies, everyone. Hi, Raga. Please, um, if you can hear me, um, you're breaking up a bit. I'm sorry. Uh, you were breaking up a bit. Um, I don't know if it's fine now. Is it? Can you hear? No, it's still breaking up. Is the has it? Uh, it's still breaking up. Sorry. Can you try to speak? Can you try to speak again? Is it better? Uh, still breaking up. Okay. Okay. Apologies, everyone. Um, so let's just give Raga a minute or two. Um, we're almost at the end of the keynote speech. Hi, Raga. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, it's perfect now. It's perfect. Yeah. Um, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, I'll, I'll make up for the lost time quickly. So um, I had spoken about the REITs track record. You know, that's something that we had to focus on market education, uh, capital raising. Um, uh, again, you know, related to that. Um, when, you're, uh, when, when you're within an unfamiliar investment class, you have to make that much more of an effort towards uh, capital raising. Um, and I think that, again, depends on the scalability. If you're looking at building one, uh, you know, just one building, one property, maybe that's, you don't need to really focus that much on capital raising. But, you know, ours is a platform that we're looking to build out. So capital raising was something that we had to focus on. Um, direct versus indirect investors would come to us and say, oh, well, I want to do this myself. Um, and you'll find that quite a lot of people, I, again, it goes back to that thing where people feel so close, closely knit to real estate, but, you know, eventually they'll, I think it's, it's about communicating and conveying to them effectively about 
uh, how it's important to work with professionals. Uh, you know, real estate is not something that anyone else, everyone can do. It, it is a complex asset class. And again, the regulatory precedents, you know, we've had to work extensively with the CMA, the Capital Markets Authority in Kenya, um, to just, you know, um, work through what the regulations are about, what they're trying to achieve and, 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 and work together so that we provide the regulator the necessary comfort. So there's a fair amount of stakeholder management. Um, and again, all of that really comes into the recommendation. Um, so I won't kind of uh, speak too much, uh, kind of repeat too much of what I've said. Uh, but in terms of, you know, anyone else looking to move into this uh, space, I think, you know, back it up with research, particularly when you go to speak to investors, I think that will uh, provide a much stronger, compelling uh, case for investment uh, with yourselves. Um, I think it's important to target patient capital as well, uh, not uh, folks who are kind of looking for hot money, you know, one or two years, and they want to be out because this is not a one or two year horizon. This is a much longer duration horizon. And so you want to get uh, someone uh, uh, or not someone, but folks with you who are uh, tied to that, um, uh, that horizon, because what you don't want is in the, you know, um, in the, in the need for quick money, urgent money, that you kind of are kicking the can down the road and facing problems uh, further on. Um, real estate, um, again, I'll refer to it. I've been in the space for 20 years. We don't have a great reputation, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, regardless of whichever market you look at. Um, and I think what we've done here is to uh, put together a robust corporate governance framework, uh, which helps uh, investors get a lot more comfort with the way we do things. We we focus a lot on transparency. Um, I have regular investor briefings on at least on a quarterly basis uh, where I sit down with investors and I talk to them about what we're up to, what are the challenges we're facing. And I think that's something important. And again, that's the stakeholder engagement. So that's, uh, that's it. I hopefully haven't overrun my time and hopefully that's been a little helpful, uh, but um, I think I'll be part of the panel. So happy to answer any further questions at that stage. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Raghav. That was very insightful. Thank you for sharing your success, challenges, um, recommendations, your perspective it was very, very insightful. And I hope that we were all able to pick, um, you know, a few points to note from there. And I'm sure that there will be questions for you um, but we would we'll take that in the Q&A um, bit of the agenda. Um, thank you once again. And so we'll be going straight um, into the panel discussion. Uh, Mr. Raghav as well would be joining us there. Um, we have um, a lot of um, brilliant and um, insightful people on the panel. Um, so I'll be handing over to uh, Jumoke Ayofamisa. Jumoke is a Senior Vice President in the Stambik IBTC Infrastructure Fund. Um, Jumake will be moderating the panel discussion. Um, good morning, Jumake. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'll be handing the pen over to you. Thank you, Tomiwa. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for staying with us so far. Um, I'll just quickly introduce our panelists um, this morning. We've already heard um, Raghav speak to us. Raghav would also be joining us in the panel discussion. We have um, with us this morning, uh, Mr. Bayomi Onosoya who is the founder CEO of um, Students Accommodate, a leading developer and operator of um, purpose-built um, students accommodation here in Nigeria. He has over 20 years experience in property trading, um, development, construction, and management of um, um, buildings. Um, so um, Mr. Nosanya, it's a pleasure to have you this morning. Um, please um, turn on your video. Um, while I also introduce the other um, panelists. We also have um, Professor Aronsi with us. He's the Dean of um, the Division of Student Affairs of Obafemi Awolowo University, which is um, one of the oldest um, federal universities, public federal universities in Nigeria. He's the former Vice Dean of the Faculty of Administration of, Ob of Obafemi Awolowo University and also a former head of the Department of Local Government and Development Studies. Um, Prof, it's a pleasure to have you um, this morning. Thank you. Um, with us also is uh, Mr. Ekundayo Onojobi. Um, Mr. Ekundayo is a managing associate 
and team lead in the firm, the legal firm of Udo, Udoma and Belo Osage. He has consistently, he has um, a wide um, expertise in, um, in various um, aspects of the law related, such as um, corporate restructuring, advisory, capital markets, and real estate. Um, key clients he has um, served include um, the IFC, the Federal Government of Nigeria, MTN, Mixta Africa, PLC, just to mention a few. Um, he was appointed as part of the six-month panel that investigated the Ikoyi building collapse um, in Lagos. Um, and it's a pleasure to have you with us this morning, Mr. Ekundayo. Um, so we, we would, Mr. Boniface um, from the NUC would also be joining us in the panel discussion. Um, so thank you very much. I invite the panelists to please um, turn on their videos and um, also um, unmute um, when um, I direct a question to them. Um, so I think a good place to start this morning is from the university side. We've heard from um, Mr. Boniface of the NUC um, speaking to us about the gap, um, which the NUC is well aware of and open to addressing. Um, so if I can start with you, Prof, what is the current um, situation of students' accommodation in OAU? We all know OAU has been around since the 60s. So what is the situation? What are the um, gaps um, from the number of bed spaces and the number of students? Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Jumoke. Pleasure to be uh, on this webinar. Um, you have introduced me, and I'm very happy about it. So, uh, the current situation of uh, accommodation in Upper Femi Awolo in this environment um, is inefficient. I mean, it's not sufficient enough to be able to cater for the large number of students who have, for example. The number of students that we have already. In the university uh, is about 35,000. We data for only about 10,000 is a student population. Uh, as far as the population we have on campus, we have 10 hostels, over 10,000 students out of about 35,000. That present shows that we have more hostels to be built for because the demand uh, ways this one in terms of uh, students, which has always been the Hakuian task to be able to look at and with these students from various parts of residence. What we do majorly is to encourage students to balance, you know, in order to ensure fairness and justice among the students. So, whether we're not that or not, what we need is that we need to accommodate more of these students, particularly in view of the fact that. When uh, security is guaranteed much more than what the campus, and that opportunity of the students to the uh, lecture halls and some other areas to be uh, better uh, utilized when they are within the university community, so students prefer the on campus. That's why it's very, very difficult for us to uh, allocate people. They will, everyone wants to be on campus. But whether we like that, we will now uh, encourage the uh, developers to be able to come and assist in developing hostels. So, so uh, a greater percent of residents, therefore, are resting outside the university. Uh, that also uh, presents some other challenges. So, we discover that we need more hostels if we really want to. That's to answer your question. Thank you very much, sir. And um, it's you know it's amazing how the stats which you've reeled out, where OAU has students' population in excess of thirty-five thousand and just ten thousand spaces, which is about twenty-eight percent, greatly aligns to what the information we got from the NUC representative. And um, so, and 
you know, your position that the university is also looking to solve this problem is also very much aligned to why we're on this call today. Um, so, uh, so Mr. Bayomi, you've heard from the prof, the demand is there. How are developers able to align and meet with the demand? He said that um, the fact that, you know, there's availability of space on campus, he has seen repeatedly that students will love to stay on campus as against off campus. Um, there's security and a number of positives. So how are developers able to meet this demand? Are there any challenges or bottlenecks as of today that developers um, realize or that are seen, you know, that can, you know, make it very difficult to um, close this gap? Thank you, Jumoke. Um, so to get straight into, into the question, uh, the, the challenges that developers are facing today are mainly limited to finance deal structuring um, and title. Um, so I, I believe that starting with uh, title, uh, one of the challenges that we face in the in the industry today is is the you know the length of, of titles that come with with these uh, with these concession plans. Um, there are there are laws in place that limit the number of years in which a concession um, can be granted to to a third party developer. And that typically sometimes places a, a bit of a barrier on, on um, access to finance. Um, and that takes me to the second challenge, uh, which is access to finance. Um, we live in an environment that has a high uh, you know, debt uh, cost. Um, so developers are struggling, um, firstly with equity to participate in, in these projects, but also um, being able to obtain long-term finance. So I think what, what developers need is access to, to long-term funding. And when I say long-term funding, ideally uh, 15 years plus um, at um, ideally single digit, uh, digit rates. Um, but notwithstanding, we, we understand that we're in an environment that has high interest rates. So that does, does pose a, a problem. And then I think lastly, also the, the deal structure. And I think that uh, developers need to come up with innovative um, structures that uh, make it a win-win for both the university stakeholders, the financing partners, and potentially the long-term partners who are able to hold on to these, um, this, these asset classes. All right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Onosanya. And um, I would, um, from your response regarding finance and the sort of tenors that you'll be looking for, my, my question to you then would be, could it be that the cost of construction is then too high? You know, um, Raghav spoke about scalability. I looked at the, um, some of the stats he showed us where seven buildings had over 4,400 bed spaces. That's an approximate um, number of um, approximately six, over 600 bed spaces per building. Um, could it be that it's our construction model or the way those construction contracts have been priced that is you know, shooting out the costs, which um, to another angle would also impact um, pricing? Uh, yes, I definitely think that uh, cost of construction places a, a, a major, uh, poses a major challenge. Um, we've looked at, um, as student accommodate, we've looked at alternative building methods um, in order to, to bring the, the cost of developing down um, as, as low as possible. However, this has sometimes been a challenge given that um, a lot of the, the alternative building materials are imported. So we have a challenge in the, in the sense that uh, accessing FX is a problem. Um, but I think that in the, long, in the long run, building design does, does contribute quite significantly to the, the ultimate um, cost of, of development. Um, we're constantly seeking different types of alternative building um, materials and different designs in order to bring down the cost of construction. Thank you very much. Um, to you, Raghav, I know one of the positives or one way you mentioned that you've um, achieved um, skill is ensuring your projects are delivered on cost and on time. Uh, perhaps if you could share some insights as to how you've achieved this, is it in the contracting? Are there other insights that you think we can um, find useful um, for our own environment here? Um, no, yeah, sure. I mean, look, I think um, uh, ultimately uh, uh, 
you know, in real estate uh, delivery, uh, those are the three key tenets uh, in development. You've got cost, time, and uh, quality. And, um, you know, it's it's not easy in uh, in real estate, as I'm sure uh, the other panelists can attest to. It's the type of industry we 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 work in. Um, I think the you know, if I was to share any insights, uh, one would be uh, I think the need for um, uh, you know establishing a professional team um, uh, that. It, it, is not is just goes beyond site management. It's about kind of having uh, uh, that experience, that knowledge with respect to you know also contracts and how contracts should be upheld. Um, uh, because uh, sometimes what you find is, and you know I've been on site as well um, uh, of managing projects, but you kind of get in the throes of day to day physical work, and you you're like you know, focus more on developing good relationships with the contractor, which is the what one should do because uh, uh, relationships are what ultimately deliver um, anything in life. But, um, you know, it's, um, uh, it, 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 I think it's, it, it's important that you can also take a step back and, and be able to uh, impose certain controls as and when necessary. Another thing that I've learned uh, based on experience is, uh, you need to set the ground rules at the outset. We come up with a specific document, um, um, uh, you know, in advance of uh, commencing the development process, um, and uh, where in in that document we lay out the rules um, uh, on how the on the conduct, on you know what the timelines are, how we're going to try and achieve things, and then what we do is um, uh, before the commencement of the development cycle, we will get the different uh, stakeholders, whether it be the contractors, important subcontractors or consultants, we get them, we all sit at a table together and we say, okay, this is, uh, this is how we're gonna try and achieve this. Um, and you know, uh, if, you, if you have any issues with anything that's, here, uh, that's noted here, uh, then speak up now or forever hold your peace. So you, you you set the ground rules early on and then, you know, you work towards them. Uh, contractors never hold their peace regardless, but, but uh, at least uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, you can hold on to uh, in some form or the other in the future. Thank you so much, um, Raghav. Um, so Prof, coming back to you, we've been talking price, price, price. Everyone knows OEU for Aluta. I'm sure when you hear OEU, you hear student unionism, Aluta. I attended OEU, so I can attest to that. How important is pricing? You know, is would it be a case where a developer comes, puts um, a mix of private money or public money into it, and then students are insisting on a fixed price? Um, will the university be insisting on controlling pricing? And what's the likelihood that we would see a situation where Students are revolting, um, saying that oh, um, the the hostels are too expensive. Thank you very much for that question. Um, in Upper Female University, where I work, eventually where we also graduate. Now we have those ones built by government. These ones have fixed prices. And that is exactly what students do. For developers, the developers who come on build, operate, and transfer are approach. They are the people who the price. I don't forget we have a period, any of them, uh, under normal circumstances, like time is added. We give them a period of 30 years in which they are going to operate the posters. Within that period, they are in charge of giving the prices to students. And they will ensure that all the facilities are provided. In what you see, when you get most of these hotels, particularly the student village area, we have phase one, phase two, and phase three of the student village university. Now, in those areas, you can't find any students. Before they even entered, that they know how much they will be and they will pay. So the issue of Luther doesn't affect them. 
Uh, the only thing that can bring about uh, uh, protest in the form of uh, uh, the students and the manager is the fact that if there are opportunities and not education, uh, for example, electricity, water, mm -hmm. if uh, those ones are in Nigeria or then we want to test. But they were even, they are always civil. So for us, there's no problem as far as the developers are concerned. If you want to come to the university, you can come. And all those who have been here have been called foreign grants in the university. All right. Thank you, Prof. Um, so, um, and it's interesting to note that um, you said OEU offers up to 30 years concession. I'm happy yeah. to, um, um, at least that would give um, developers a better incentive to yeah. want to come to OAU. And contrary to the perception, and this just fits into why we are here to demystify a number of wrong assumptions that exist that, oh, a place like OAU students would revolt. So I'm happy um, to hear know. that um, as, as long as facilities are right, um, yeah, as long as it, the developer is sticking to the terms of reference um, and the students yes. are made aware of the prices up front. It should be a smooth um, relationship. Um, that's good. Um, so moving to the legal side, um, um, and to I'll be going to uh, Ms. Sekundaya from UUB. Within the legal framework, can tertiary in institutions, especially the public ones, can they enter into financing arrangements um, or, and, or are there regulations um, restricting them? I would like to get your views um, being a lawyer and I would also um, reach out to Mr. Boniface to also get his own view from the NUC side. So um, Ekunda, if you could unmute, thank you. Um, we can't hear you, Ekunda, you're still muted. Oh, sorry, apologies. Okay. So um, in terms of the regulations vis-a-vis -vis their ability to procure financing, the, the space of the public of the public tertiary institution is actually quite different from that of private because um, um, the public institutions are creation of laws. And if you review the enabling acts, the enabling acts or laws as the case may be, um, I've, I realized that he did not, even though it, he established them as a legal person, personality, it actually did not give them the powers to, to undertake such financing arrangement. And for, for obvious reasons as it, as it, as it is. So the, the challenge with, uh, the, so the, unlike their private counterparts who are creation of, um, of the Companies and Allied Matters Act and who can undertake and enter into contract as they so deem fit, you know, the public, um, uh, the public guys can't really do that. And, and what, that, what that then means for them in terms of um, doing joint ventures or providing halls of residences for, for their students is that their contribution to those projects more often than not, it's just the land. So they, they are only able to contribute the land and, and may not be able to um, 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 provide financing or be able to obtain third party financing, which is where people like Mr. Anosaya comes in. They provide the land and Mr. Anosaya provides them with the, with the funds and they're able to develop the project. So unlike the private tertiary institutions, the public tertiary institutions are, are unable to, um, to access those kinds of um, financing arrangements. All right, thank you. And um, just to take off from where you stopped regarding the provision of land, are such land um, available as collateral to any potential? Sorry, okay, I can't hear you. Okay, um, can, any, can anyone else hear me? Okay, I can hear you. Hear you, Claire. Hello? Okay, hear you. Okay. Um, I can, okay. Um, Ekundayo, everyone else can hear me. Um, I don't yeah. know if there's anyone else from your side. Um, okay, while well, we wait for um, Ekundayo to... Yes, I can hear you now. Thanks. I was, I was trying to find out, those land, the land the university provides, can a financier um, rely on it as collateral? Can a legal mortgage be registered on it? Or, or what is the approach? 
Okay, so by the provisions of the relevant statutes, and you know, I looked at a couple, a couple of those statutes, there's an express prohibition or there's an express restriction in the enabling law for creating any interest in a university land. So a university cannot, generally speaking, create any form of interest, mortgage, leasehold, however you so describe it, they cannot create it. The exception to that is that they can create um, um, a lease for 21 years, or they can grant a lease to the member of the university. So the ability of the university to deal with land and provide us of residence is usually within the bandwidth of that exception of a 21 year. So for them to be able to create any lease hold or any mortgage arrangement, they will have to get um, um, the express or the general or specific um, um, consent of the presidency. And I, I noticed that when we started the conversation, I think it was Mr. Boniface, someone mentioned that um, there are ongoing discussions with the ICRC to enable universities enter into you know, proper concession and public-private arrangements. So it'd be interesting to understand the framework of that and see the extent to which it enables them. But currently speaking, based on the enabling law that creates um, the acts creating this university, there is a restriction on their ability to deal with the land, save for the 21 year um, um, window that they have. All right, um, that 21 year leasehold window, is that, does that have anything to do with the tenor of the concession agreements or they are two separate things? So um, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's, mm. that is the maximum time that they can grant an interest in land. So okay. if they are entering into any arrangement, and, uh, and I'm happy that we all have professionals on this, we can structure it, slice and dice it however we want. You can have um, a 21 year that is revolving, you can have, you know, you can have a 21 year that is renewable, we can slice and dice it. But in the first okay. instance, what they are able to do is to enter into arrangements for 21 years. And okay. then, uh, you know, as, as a financier, you then ask yourself, am I able to recoup my investment within the 21 year window? You're asking yourself, what are the guarantees that after 21 years, the new administration you know, will renew those things. So you are only, you are only guaranteed that 21 years. And um, what, if I were advising um, um, a developer like your student accommodate, what I will try to do is to ensure that my construction period is not part of that 21 years. Mm. That, that's what I would try to do. So you structure it in such a way that my construction period is not part of the 21 years and the 21 years is really for me to recoup my investment. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Boniface, um, just to also get clarity, you know, based on what we've heard from um, Ekundayo, um, can you shed more light on what um, the NUC, what the commission is um, working on with um, ICRC? Um, to enable universities, you know, um, you know, a, um, solve this accommodation problem, you know, especially from a public-private um, financing partnership point of view. Mr. Boniface. Um, if you're speaking, we can't hear you yet. Okay, perhaps while we wait for um, Mr. Boniface to come on, I'll just ask um, Professor Aronsi, um, even though I can probably imply it, but um, the governing council for OAU, you know, how open, I know you've um, talked a lot about how OAU is really looking to solve this gap. So if a developer wants to come and set up um, student accommodation in OAU, what is the process? Who should they be talking to? You know, what are what is the expectation, you know, from a university perspective, such that the developer can bear some things in mind before approaching the university? Thank you very much. The very first thing the developer will have to do is to write an application. That application will be directed to the village and student village development committee. Um, the application may also be directed to the vice chancellor of the So, if it is to the uh, student village development committee, the director of 
capital, I mean, Division of Capital Project and Development University. Look at that, I mean, at the application. What the application has been looking for, who now invites the developer into the university for interaction, a kind of interview. Um, we want to ascertain the financial capability of a developer. Uh, if it says we want to uh, develop uh, maybe a 20,000 uh, test space hostel, what is his source of income? How does he want to do it? And you know, there will be a time that is going to be given to him. How will he be able to uh, execute this project within this limited time? For example, he's going to be a bond kind of project that he wants to do. This is going to be a bond kind thing. Uh, we want to find out whether he has the financial muscle able to uh, develop the project. But it could be okay. High rise buildings that will take about two years or more. We also want to find out that. And after that, we are going to give the tentative approval, which may eventually uh, translate to a permanent uh, approval. On the long run, if the developer satisfies the stipulations of the issue of capital uh, projects and development of the university. And of the plants, some of the bill of purchases, and so on and so forth. All these will have to be looked into before we know that a developer really wants to do that. This is a very good chair. Thank you, Prof. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. All right. Um, sorry, yes. your line was a bit um, sketchy, but I believe I got oh. most of what you said. Um, that a developer would be required to write an application um, through the oh, student yes. as well as the director of capital projects, um, following which a developer yes. will be invited for interactions such that the university can conduct yes. proper due diligence on its financial capability, as well as um, yes. experience and ability to, de to deliver on time and on budgets, following which the yeah. approval process will go on. Thank you so much, um, Prof. Um, um, Ekundaya, to you, uh, given the explanation you've given to us on the land and all of that and the restrictions on the borrowing powers of universities, can universities enter into um, a JV such that um, an SPV, a special purpose vehicle, can be established where the university is present, the developer is present, or the law as it is currently does not allow for that? So, um... Technically speaking, a university can do that because um, um, the Senate, if you look at the establishment laws, especially for the federal universities, the Senate is vested with the powers to deal with um, the provisions of halls of residences and accommodation. So in technical terms, the, a student accommodate can approach an OAU and then both of them can decide to form an SPV to, you know, to undertake that project. The, but I will... I, I will counsel against it personally. And the reason I will do that is because once you do that, then the, the assets, it will be seen, and this is not legal, it's not really legal. The assets will be seen as a university asset, and then you will be caught up oh, yes. in the web of, you will be caught up in the web of um, um, collections. So the various restrictions that apply to university assets and university revenues, you know, will also apply to you. So while the Senate, has the power to deal with to you know handle issues around the house of residence that enables them to um you know enter in, enter into joint ventures however they want to structure it either a jv or an spv they can do that but in terms of the practicality and the workability especially from the developer side it may not be um the best it may not be the uh, an optimal uh, the best decision for them at least from a developer side Okay, thank you so, so you much. Can then the structuring, you know, another way that you would achieve the same results, but you know, um, um, make the life of the developer easier. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and I would um, go to Mr. Bayomi now to say, okay, in your experience, how have you have you done any transaction where it was a JV approach? Um, what has your experience been? And if you haven't, why is it 
in relation to what um, to what Ekundaya has just said. And also, we've had a lot of discussion on the price. How, how have you been able to strike a balance between quality and price, quality and cost? You know, there's always that uh, difficulty. Given the Nigerian um, factor, how have you um, managed that balance? And what has your experience been from a transaction structuring point of view? Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, just wanted to first of all touch on what uh, Prof has just outlined. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with um, his uh, summary. We've actually been through the process with OAU ourselves, um, and I'd like to commend them on the fact that it went as smoothly as Prof has, uh, has mentioned. Um, we do have a project coming up in OAU that we expect to start construction next month. Um, and that should see us deliver just about um, 800 beds um, across the entire the development. Um, to answer your question about uh, joint ventures, um, we typically, and as Ekendaya has eloquently <laughs> expressed, we do not get involved in joint ventures with universities um, because it does create quite a, a, number, of, a number of challenges. Um, we do, however, structure our transactions in joint ventures, and we, we find that that's the best way in which to, to deal with this, uh, this, uh, any particular developments going, going forward. Um, now, to talk about pricing, um, affordability is a big challenge in, in the whole of Nigeria. Um, what we did was when we started our business, we created three different types of, of uh, student accommodation, uh, what you could call a business class, a premium economy, and an economy version. Um, and these would vary significantly. Um, some would have as many as four or six beds, and some would be as many as one or two beds. And we did this primarily to understand where the market for scale was in Nigeria and where affordability levels um, lay. So what we found was that at the very high end, Supply is typically not an issue. Um, private universities, um, you know, private uh, um, developers who have done small units typically have lots of accommodation available and they're quite highly priced. Um, at the very low level, um, we believe that that's where the biggest demand is um, and that's where there isn't enough, enough uh, supply. However, the challenge is being able to meet the, the returns profile that investors require. So we've effectively created a middle, middle ground that is, um, that is accessible in terms of affordability, um, but it doesn't truly solve the big challenge of trying to meet, I, I believe it's about 1.6 million beds that are, that, are, that, that are required to meet the gap. Um, our total addressable market is somewhere in the region of about 50,000. Um, and this is what we believe that um, people, you know, can afford in that middle, middle ground. Um, so to, to, to go back to the question, we do a lot of research, try to understand, looking at the demographics of our particular target institutions, what the affordability is. And then we now look at the, the property that we're building. So we try to marry the two, whereas you develop a, a high quality product that is not overly priced but yet affordable. And you know, it takes a bit of skill balancing between the two, um, but it's early days for our business and it's still, it's still a learning experience. And we're four or five years old, but we're still, we're still learning on how to, to deliver the perfect um, assets at the right price that is affordable and investors can also see a decent return. Thank you. And um, it's interesting to note that um, you have a project coming up in OAU, and one of the um, perceptions or limitations, you know, when you talk students' accommodation in public university, the first thing people throw at you is risk of, stri of strike. You know, the universities were on strike for a long time earlier this year. There are indications that they may go back on, um, on strike, giving some strike risk. I don't know if you, want, you would like to speak um, specifically to the OAU or just broadly with respect to your other transactions, how have you managed um, that in your um, transaction structuring? Okay, so so um, and I'm giving out a little bit of our trade secret here, but um, it's all for the ecosystem. So what we do is we, we balance our portfolios. Um, strike is, is something we can't get away from in, in the Nigerian um, space. It's, it's inevitable until 
the, the way universities are funded is fixed. It, it will always be there. So what we do is we create a portfolio that is mixed between on campus, off campus, private and public universities. So what we see is that um, when there are inevitable strikes, there is still some revenue that comes in into the portfolio. So rather than being fully exposed to one particular type of university, once it's balanced. Um, and you know, when you look back over the years, the, the longest strike action what well, the average strike action is typically no more than two to two months or so um so it, it balances the portfolio and you still have revenue okay. coming in and we're able to to manage um mm -hmm. manage the, the portfolio in that basis okay um thank you um Ekundayo, um is there anything from a legal standpoint um that developers can stand to benefit in mitigating this um, strike risk or is just something for them to deal with and accept Okay, um, I think that they can, in negotiating the contract with, you, with the university, insert provisions in there that enables them to take the benefits of the assets when the school is not on. So for examples, for example, rather, if there's a, during the last, I think the last strike action was for, for about eight months, so what I would typically advise my developer to do in that instance will be when negotiating the deal, you try to project what the worst case scenario will be and then say, what else, how else can we sweat these assets? So you then begin to use those assets for things like um, 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 you speak to companies or religious organizations that may want to do retreats and will need to house you know, the, the participants of their events. So if, you, if you're building clauses like that into your contract, that gives you the flexibility that gives, so let me put it this way, that gives you the flexibility to sweat the assets using other alternatives, however, still maintaining the priority of the student accommodation. So if you're able to achieve that in your documentation, then even when the students who are your primary customers are not on ground, then you have the leeway to utilize the assets, you know, for something else as the agreement may, may allow you to do. So that may be something that um, developers may want to look at. It is purely contractual. All right, thank you. And just to ask Prof, whether um, in OAU opening up and inviting developers, you know, how have they addressed these questions when developers ask them or pose this risk, um, the risk of strike action? How, how has OAU positioned it with developers? So, uh, Yes, what is happening uh, in developers and students is that there's always an agreement. They go here again, they pay per year. You know, in OAU, that's what they do. But when they pay, it is supposed to be one year. In fact, the strike you know, it, it doesn't even come to pay that. So, in terms mm. of their cash flow and some other things, you know, the money will just come in. But, you know, the students are now approaching us to say that kind of uh, 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 certain things should be done for them, especially because the strike. That, you know, there is a committee that you can see a second, which will also uh, uh, continue to look into this because it hasn't been this uh, bad. You know, but like, uh, yes. Uh, yes, you know, the strike usually in two, three months to be over. But the very last one that took six months, uh, months was just rather pray it doesn't happen any longer. You know, the developers they should have value in their money. And mm. you know, at the same time, students themselves uh, should not, you know what really happened during the period uh, that we had the last week? Our students made use of the opportunity. They even in the coasters to begin to learn some uh, skills. Mm. That's when you're going to leave the hostel. So, but for those who left the hostel, they will be looking for a way of letting people get to an era back as part of compensation for the period. Mm. But I want to say that it doesn't, as far as OAU is concerned, the period did not have. Okay. What I can say precisely because we as a university, we don't interfere with mm. it is an agreement. Build, mm. They operate for a certain period before. Since it has not been transferred to us, 
they will manage that, but we don't deal with them. That's why I don't want to discuss it. But even parents, the welfare of the students, is also paramount. That's where I'm going to Okay. Thank you so much, Prof. And um, if I can summarize quickly, um, that the current um, agreement or the way things are run in OAU is that the students pay per year, which is more suited to the calendar, yes. the normal calendar as against the yes. academic calendar. Um, yes. And that is, yeah, the developer protection against strike. And it's um, yes. heartwarming to hear that the university is taking a commercially pragmatic um, position whilst also balancing that with the interest of um, the students. Um, just before we round up, I'll just touch on issues relating to facility management. Um, Prof, in OAU, where you have a developer that has set up um, accommodation, how involved is the school in matters of facility management, electricity, water? Can, you know, how, how is it being managed? Will the developer have to, does the developer have a free hand to do, uh, uh, you know, to solve that problem as it deem fit? Um, what's the, how involved is the university in that? So we can't hear you, sir. You can hear me. Okay, I can hear you now. Yes, you can hear me now. So the facilities yes. that we have, you know, uh, built by developers and built by them. But we started okay. handling the university uh, provides access roads, mm. uh, access to water, you know, mm. all this would have been provided initially. But when they get to the uh, to, to the ground, when they are uh, operating, so it is they who want to manage. Mm. That is what we do in OAU. So until eventually they hand over the building to the school. Box, mm. So by the facilities, but the, the managers of the, uh, the uh, access that we have given to them in terms of uh, land, water supply, mm. in terms of uh, roads, as well as what is But anything that happens after that, they will have to take over. Okay. Show that these facilities are in good condition uh, mm. benefits of our students. That's what we call it. As a matter of fact, university sets up a committee that looks into that. And okay. This process to ensure that our students limit their All right. Thank you, Prof. Um, and from what I got, um, the developers have responsibility to ensure that the um, hostels are well managed at least pending, during the concession period, pending when um, they hand over to the university and the university yes. has a committee yes. that ensures that the developer is keeping up to the agreed um, standards. Um, to um, yes. Mr. Bayomi, how are you addressing the facility management issue? One major problem, which everybody sees in Nigeria, oh, we have a poor maintenance culture. Um, so how are you dealing um, this? Do you um, think facility management is best outsourced or should the developer manage it? You know, what are your views on facility management? Um, so our view is that um, facility management is partly outsourced. So we believe in, in experts and experienced people doing what they do very well. Um, Looking at the broader operations and management of, of each development, we think it's important that experienced OM managers actually manage the, the facility on a day to day basis. Um, managing a student housing facility is very different to that of a residential or commercial unit. Um, so at Student Accommodate, we manage our developments in-house. We have a team that's dedicated to, to the operations. We have resident managers, et cetera, et cetera. But with things specifically related to facilities management, then we work with third-party um, operators. So whether it be the, the power cleaning, uh, security, and things like that, we, we work with third-party uh, providers. All right. Um, thank you. And if I can just ask um, Raghav, um, from what um, Mr. Bayomi has said, is that approach um, the one which you 
um, used in Kenya as well, where facility management is um, partly or fully outsourced. Yeah, no, thank you. And look, I think, you know, each each market is different in its own right. And uh, of course, one has to, rec you know, respect uh, uh, the constraints uh, uh, that uh, that are there. Um, as far as we're concerned, you know, it's one of the slides I showed earlier. We've we've essentially insourced everything. Um, uh, uh, the reason that we do that is because um, unfortunately, here in Kenya, we don't have uh, the, um, the 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 skill set, the expertise that is available with agencies that can take on um, uh, uh, you know the, uh, the 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 management of the student accommodation properties. And I think uh, Mr. Abayomi was 100% right in that you know managing these assets is a very different ball game to office residential um, and so for us because it's also such a key part of the value chain uh, we are not able to take the risk of um, you know allocating that work to someone else who doesn't necessarily have the experience we're not you know doesn't have the experience at all um, because as I mentioned we're the really the only institutional provider of student accommodation um, in, in Kenya so it's not like that sector has grown that you you have like you know experienced agencies who are able to offer the the kind of service that we we are. So what we've done on the property management side is actually develop our own digital platform to manage uh, the properties as well on a day to day basis. And this is the way we can ensure that we're able to provide the customer experience, which ensures that our properties are at over ninety percent occupancy. Thank you. Um, thank you, Raghav, and thank you to all our panelists. Um, we appreciate your openness um, to share information. It's been a very um, insightful and um, educative session. And um, personally, I believe that a number of the myths um, associated with um, students' um, accommodation financing in, um, in the country have been um, addressed. So right now, we'll go into um, the Q&A. Um, we have a question um, directed to um, Raghav, right, um, regarding your I rates and D rates. That do your I rates purchase assets from your D rates, and how do you deal with the conflict of interest perception? No, it's a an excellent question to whoever asked it, um, um, and and very perceptively, you are right. Um, the 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 D rate is essentially the pipeline feeder for the I rate, um, and and uh, any income rate globally is uh, one of the main factors behind its success is scaling, the ability to scale up. So when we launched the iREIT, we were at three assets. Now we are at five assets. Next year, we'll be at seven. Uh, at least that's the aim. That's the target. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, for um, uh, and in terms of the transfer pricing, which was which is a very fair question that's been asked, we have um, you know, it goes back to that uh, that point that I made about corporate governance. Um, what we have established is two separate uh, investment com committees, which are mutually exclusive with mutually exclusive membership for both REITs. So each REIT investment committee is meant to assess any transaction um, on, you know, uh, kind of its own um, uh, strength and merit. Um, what we also have is we have established a corporate governance committee at our end, um, uh, and this corporate governance committee is comprised of independent membership, and what they're meant to do is anytime there's a transaction that is taking place, you know, any related party transaction, so between the DREIT and the IREIT, uh, they are meant to assess that due process was followed, that we haven't gone uh, against any regulations, um, that we followed the investment policy. Uh, the other thing that we have is that uh, each uh, REIT has its own independent valuer. Um, so we have each independent valuer come up with their own valuation for the mm. common uh, asset. And then uh, on that basis, uh, you know, we are able to come to a conclusion as to what is the fair uh, market yes. value for mm. uh, the uh, asset transfer. So we, we uh. have put together a framework and mechanisms to avoid those suspicions of conflict of interest. All right, thank you so much, um, Raghav. Um, we have another question relating to the JV. Given the challenges with the JV structure that has been outlined um, by Ekundayo, 
and also corroborated by uh, Mr. Bayomi, what structure works? If the JV um, has its issues, what structure? Is it purely um, the developer going add on? You know, what are the alternatives? Um, if I can hand it over to you, Mr. Bayomi. Okay. Okay, so we've we've gone forward with um, concessions, um, you know, build operate transfers. Those are um, structures that work. Um, we've been able to successfully um, get them financed, um, um, and I think going forward, that's that's the most likely um, structure that we will use. I think the detail um, is in the wordings and the, the agreements and the the, the way it's it's structured. I don't know if Ekundaya has anything he wants to to add to that. Um, yes, you're right, and um, it's really it's really a matter of um, how it is how it is described. Um, as long as we are playing within the ambit of the quote and unquote of the twenty one years that the university has autonomy to deal with, then we can describe it however so we want. And um, one other thing we may want to look at is depend. So one other thing you may just want to do is if you don't want to. Um, you want to keep the university at arm's length. Um, you can just decide that both parties, they give you a lease of the property for 21 years. And then your consideration is that you build, you operate, and then you transfer to them after 21 years. That way, you know, the asset is ring fenced from them and you have the autonomy to run it for, for 21 years. It is not their asset. The receivables are not there. So you're not caught by TSA and you're just, you know, you're doing it independently. Another structure, and uh, you know, it would be nice to hear what Mr. Bayomi has to say. Another structure you may want, depending on the type of, um, depending on the university's preference, because option one, the university doesn't get anything for 21 years. You run the asset, you spend it for 21 years, after which you transfer to them. Option two, the university may say, oh no, we can't, you know, sit down and not earn any income from this. So what you can decide to do in that instance is, um, you develop say, six, six blocks, and depending on your um, your 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 split, the ratio for splits, you develop say six blocks, and then you hive out two to the university. You run four, you know, and all of this is just all of these are efforts to ensure that your funds are not commingled with the university. Mm -hmm. So it's really a nomenclature issue. We can we can structure it. Anything that Mr. Biobi wants, we'll put it in paper, and we'll make it work <laughs> as long as his money is protected. <laughs> Uh, All right. Do you have any rejoinder to that, uh, Mr. Bayomi? Yeah, I just want to um, point out that um, it's important that universities understand that these um, structures are there to help solve the student accommodation problem rather than providing income to, mm -hmm. to, to the university. So our approach typically is that, you know, we're trying to solve an issue and we understand that, you um, you know, there are times when income is required. So again, as Ekunda has eloquently put it, it's about how you, how you, uh, you structure the 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 the, de the detail within the agreements. All right, thank you, um, Raghav. I saw your notes. Just a question for you: What sort of return benchmarks do you have on your project, either from your own point of view as? A company and also from your investors point of what sort of return benchmarks do you set yeah thank you um and and uh again a very good question because the one thing to note is because it didn't get covered in my presentation is that the REITs are offered as a blended uh offering um they are uh, uh essentially any investor coming in uh is uh, is to subscribe to both REITs at the same time. So you put in mm -hmm. a 30% investment in the development REIT and a 70% investment in the uh, income REIT. And that gives you a long-term uh, return of 18%. So really that's essentially the cost of capital you could say that we're working with. Um, and that, you know, again, um, I, it was a very fair point uh, raised by Mr. Abayomi. Um, we do live in a high interest rate environment where unfortunately we are competing with government securities more than any other private enterprise. So essentially, if the government is out there doling out uh, T-bills and securities at a high interest rate, that's what pension funds will compare you to. So for us, because real estate yield, and I'm, I'm sure everyone's seen this real estate yield 
uh, for stabilized assets never comes matches up to um, uh, uh, matches up to uh, you know what the government can offer or does offer. Uh, the way to you know then tackle that issue was to offer them this commingled offering where you have to then take on a little bit of that development risk, that development uh, 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 you know uh, 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 development risk, so that you can also then benefit from the development return and therefore, you know, on a weighted average basis, we're able to give a return premium over what the government does. It does. Okay. Thank you so much, Raghav. And um, um, we are happy for you to um, join your drop off and join your other call at this time. If um, there are other questions for you, we'll be sure to direct them to the email that you've provided. Um, we do appreciate you making our time to join us this morning. Thank you so much, Jim okay? and thank you uh, to the rest of the Standbeck Stand IBTC team. And it was a pleasure uh, sharing the space with the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, from the Nigerian angle, Mr. Bayomi, um, what sort of return do you, um, benchmarks do you set? Um, again, um, we're competing with um, <laughs> very, very challenging uh, sort of um, of opponents in terms of uh, fixed income and government rates. But um, we tend to look for yields anywhere from sort of 8% um, when compared to residential real estate is double. Um, but you know it's 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 a it's a difficult market that I think is beginning to open up, and I think that as you have more players coming into the sector, um, you know competition should help to increase that that number. Okay, okay, um, thank you. I know we have a question um, asking about um, the thirty-year concession from OAU versus the twenty-one years um, leasehold. Um, Cap. Um, perhaps, um, Ekundaya, if you could just go over that again to clarify. Okay. Um, um, I think the, the 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 simplest the simplest answer to it is, as a developer, if you're going into, you want to get into, you know, the the accommodation solutions for universities. The first thing is get your lawyer who will do a due diligence and find out what the, um, the permissible duration for your JV is. Uh, for quite a number of um, federal universities, the, the, the allowable duration, the autonomy they have, rather, for LISO is usually typically 21 years. Now, I'm not saying OEU doesn't have 30 years because I have not had the benefit of studying or looking through the Establishment Act, but it could as well be that it could be one of two things. One, Either the Establishment Act actually grants them a 30-year duration, and then all subsequent investors were 21 years, or two, they have some sort of um, 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 presidential blanket approval or a specific approval that enables them to do that 30 years. Whatever the case is, it's just important that the enabling law be studied to, uh, to ensure that you know we are playing within the permissible um, duration. That's really it. So if you check the enabling law for um, I, I think it's Amadou Bilo Abubakar Tafa Balewa is 21 years and a whole lot of um, federal universities, um, the autonomy they have for LISO to play around with is 21 years without which, um, above which they will require the, pre the presidential um, um, sign off for them to do that. So I, I think the point there is that due diligence is key so that mm -hmm. we are not doing 30 years when actually what we are legally um, authorized to do is 21 years. So just study the ending of fine. All right, thank you. Our last question will be directed to Prof. Um, given the long concessions and knowing that oh, the university's governing council will probably change so many times within that concession period, should a developer be worried that a new governing council will come and you know revoke the concession? What sort of explanation or comfort would you give to a developer looking to approach OAU? We can't hear you yet, sir.
Sir, we can't hear you, sir. Prof, your, your line is muted. Uh. Professor, Prof Aronsi, we can't hear you. Okay, I'm not sure you can hear us. Um, okay, uh, I'll just hand over back to um, Tomiwa. We very much appreciate everyone on our panel this morning for making our time um, to join us, answer our questions. We really do appreciate it. And we trust that um, when next we have um, a session on this very interesting uh, um, subject of focus, you will be sure to honor us with your invitation. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Back to you, um, Tomiwa. Thank you, thank you, thank you once again. Um, I mean, Jimothy, I said it all. It was a very interesting um, discussion, and I hope that we all took a few points um, from there. I took a lot. Um, thank you once again. So I'll be handing over to, uh, for the closing remark, I'll be handing over to um, Tola Kiyomi. Um Tola is the head of real estate finance, West Africa, um, in Stambik, ABTC Capital Limited. Um, Tola. Thank you very much, Tommy. I'm trying to turn on my video, but for some reason, I've not been able to. Okay, yes, thank you very much. Um, a very useful uh, panel di discussion. Um, thank you once again. Um, to Abayomi Ekunda, your prof, uh, Mr. Raga uh, as well for joining in. I think well, it was very fruitful discussions generally, um, and it just goes to show the depth of the market. Um, real estate remains a key business infrastructure that is needed, you know, to to boost the economy as well as. Um, the role that it plays within the education sector. And that's why the theme of this engagement has been on student accommodation specifically. Um, it is one of the many asset classes within the real estate space. And we do feel that there is potential opportunity to scale this market. And, and you know, it, it, and it's really um, multi dimensional. Um, there is the opportunity even within the private sector space, as well as you know public universities. You know the key thing here is, is public universities, and there is a lot of opportunities. There, if, if we think about it from a nationwide perspective, um, there is clearly the the market um, in terms of you know, the demand supply gap. Um, and just hearing about me talk about the number of units and you know what what is currently looking to provide it just shows you know how much can be scaled up within the space um, so you know part of the issues we've talked about financing remains key um, some of the structuring considerations are there um, we've talked about tightening and I'm so glad to hear um, what has been said in terms of, of PPP arrangement and some of what the ICRC will be doing um, as well to um, resolve some of those critical bottlenecks. So I, I think in terms of next step, this is the first conversation. Um, there will be focused um, engagement and discussion, you know, within 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 different groups, um, because uh, from a standpoint point of view, um, we have uh, we are dedicated to supporting infrastructure growth, real estate growth within our market. And we'll be engaging the various stakeholders uh, post this, this engagement to see how we can further, uh, you know, provide support, both from a financing point of view, and also a wider ecosystem point of view and as well. Um, so this is to say thank you once again to everyone. Um, and thank you for participating in this engagement. And we look forward to even greater uh, participation, greater collaboration, and being able to create more best space within the student accommodation sector. Thank you very much. Over to you, Tommy.
Thank you very much, Tala, for that. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. We're just in time, just a minute or two shy. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, so our emails are in the chat. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we will provide responses um, as soon as possible. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Do have a great rest of the day and rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.